church. And I love this church too. <laughs> so the reading today is from Acts chapter 2, verses 1 to 21. When the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. Suddenly a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. Now they were staying in Jerusalem, God-fearing Jews from every nation under heaven. When they heard this sound, crowd came together in bewilderment because each one heard them speaking in his own language. Utterly amazed, they asked, are not all these men who are speaking Galileans? Then how is it that each of us hears them in his own native language? Parthians, Medes, and Elamites, residents of Mesopotamia, Judea and Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia, Egypt and the parts of Libya near Cyrene, visitors from Rome, both Jews and converts to Judaism, Cretans and Arabs, we hear them declaring the wonders of God in our own tongues. Amazed and perplexed, they ask one another, what does this mean? Some, however, made fun of them and said, too much wine. Then Peter stood up with the eleven, raised his voice and addressed the crowd. Fellow Jews and all of you who live in Jerusalem, let me explain this to you. Listen carefully to what I say. These men are not drunk, as you suppose. It's only nine in the morning. No, this is what was spoken by the prophet Joel. In the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions. Your old men will dream dreams. Even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days and they will prophesy. I will show wonders in the heaven above and signs on the earth below, blood and fire and billows of smoke. The sun will be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the coming of the great and glorious day of the Lord. And everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Amen. We celebrate the King of Kings who is steadfast and true for eternity. We celebrate the King of Kings who's had his ups and his downs. He's had his criticisms. He was crucified on the cross for us. And uh, he knows what it's like to be a human being and to accept or be part of a fallen world, even though he himself was without sin. And today we have, of course, another celebration because today is the festival, the feast of... Uh, there's a, 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 a big thing about feasting in the Bible, and here it is again. The, the festival, the Feast of Pentecost. Pentecost. And, of course, we do this every year, and you will be so familiar with that reading. And I gave it to Jenny because I thought I'd trip her up on some of those words, but she's been practicing, and she, uh, she got them right. So 10 out of 10. So today, we are celebrating another celebration, the celebration of Pentecost, which is the giving of the Holy Spirit to the church. In fact, it is the church's birthday, and it was born in power, it was born in fire, and that power and fire continues in the church, in the true church of Jesus Christ, and in us today. And the Bible describes, as you will know, the Holy Spirit in various ways. The Holy Spirit is a person, it's a he. He is the third person of the Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit shows that he is a person because he can be grieved. We, the people of God, we can sadden and we can grieve the Holy Spirit, particularly when we say no to him, particularly when we don't listen to him. 
The Holy Spirit is sent to us on the birth of the church to be our helper and to be our counselor, in a way to be a fantastic spouse to us, to help us and to guide us, to lift us up, to direct us, and even to rebuke us when we're going in the wrong way. The Holy Spirit can speak. Of course, the Holy Spirit is like the wind. He speaks through, through everything that there is in creation. We can see the power of God through the creation. And he even speaks, as we heard on the day of Pentecost, through Galileans speaking in all those different languages so that every person could hear the message of the gospel. The Holy Spirit, as I've said, is like wind and like fire. And the Holy Spirit has been described in numerous ways. Here's just a few sentences for you. The Holy Spirit is like a breath that blows away the dust and makes everything clean. Do you know, Helena, um, I keep saying this about Helena, we've got lots of cleaning products. I think every, every woman of a house will have cleaning products under the kitchen sink. And I really appreciate when Helena cleans the house. I absolutely appreciate it. The dust has gone. I can walk on the floor and I'm not feeling any grit. And the house is clean. And the Holy Spirit is, is, is the breath that wants to clean us up inside, wants to do a house clean, wants to come upon us in power, points out where we're going wrong, and wants to help us to be clean and holy and righteous and to walk before God. The Holy Spirit is like a refreshing cool water to a parched throat. Well, I have to say, it's hot in Spain, isn't it? And I, I give the advert again, drink plenty of water and slap on the sun cream. But the Holy Spirit is like refreshing cool water to the parched soul, to, to the person who is, is undergoing the stress and strain of life and the refreshing waters, the Holy Spirit. Just a word from God, just a touch from God can change any and every circumstance. And as soon as like, we, drink, we drink our cold water, we feel and we start to feel refreshed. The Holy Spirit refreshes us. The Holy Spirit is like a cleansing bushfire that burns away the thick undergrowth so that something new can arise out of the ashes. Isn't that wonderful? Do you know, we, we need to be renewed day by day. Every day is a new blessing with God. Every day is a new start with God. And we come and we, we give our lives to God. And, and when we mess up, the Holy Spirit is the one that can burn up all that sin and actually out of the undergrowth, up come the green shoots. Hallelujah. The Holy Spirit is a fire and a cleansing fire. The Holy Spirit is like a potter who starts with an odd-shaped lump. Let's face it, look at your neighbor and say, you're an odd-shaped lump. Okay. The Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit. And the, the Bible says this. The Bible says we are but lumps of clay. Did you not know this? We are lumps of clay. And I remember actually one day in, uh, in uh, my previous church, we, we, we got some clay, and, and as the sermon was going on, I seem to recall that some of our sculptures were sculpting amazing things out of the clay so that by the end of the sermon, we could put them on the table of the Lord and we could see some marvelous things that have come out of clay. So turn to your neighbor and say, you are a marvelous thing that has come out of clay. You are a marvelous thing that has come out of clay. The Holy Spirit takes, takes the mess of our lives. God and the power of God comes upon us and, and he can create the greatest sculpture, the greatest, the greatest uh, vase. He can create something fantastic out of each of one of us. And then we have the Holy Spirit. He's like a renovator. He uses what is already there and he strengthens, refreshes and revitalizes it. If anyone here is feeling tired or a bit run down, a bit run out, then the, the power of the Holy Spirit can come upon us today. Come forward for prayer at the end because you can be lifted up and you can be restored. God and his kingdoms in the restoring business to restore us back to the true image of God, which was God's intention for us. Hallelujah. And of course, the Holy Spirit is a bit like a parent guiding a child. Sometimes we might get a slap on the wrist. And sometimes it might feel a bit painful as the Holy Spirit loves us so much, he will warn us and guide us away from danger and he will lead us in paths that are straight. The Holy Spirit is like a tour guide. He points us through the directions of life so that we can live life to the full. He, he makes divine appointments in our lives so that we can share Jesus Christ with someone who we're just sitting down having coffee with. And he, he creates divine appointments. 
if we will listen to him and we will speak, amazing things happen. And the Seafront team, I'm amazed as to actually how many people have come to this church, come to Salt Church, because the Seafront team have been there doing the stuff, listening and going to people, speaking the things of God, and, and God is doing things in people's lives. Hallelujah. And then the Holy Spirit finally is a fierce shaking. He wakes us up. He reminds us that there is more to life than just the ordinary. You and I are made for a purpose. Our chief purpose is to worship God, is to love God. And then God in his power wants us to share God with those around us. And the Holy Spirit is the one who gives us this lovely word, an unction from the Lord. Has anyone felt had an unction from the Lord? Most of you probably don't know what unction means. It's an old Pentecostal term. Unction means that you feel something. You get an impression in your spirit that God wants you to do something, go somewhere, or say something. And I've had an unction from the Lord, and I remember when I was uh, going to Nottingham to be um, a prison chaplain, and I needed to find and buy a house. And we, we only had one day to try to do it. And we were in a, an estate agent, and I felt an unction from the Lord. This is the wrong estate agent. Go to this estate agent. And uh, we did. We heard the Lord, and I said to him, we've got to go now. I didn't want the estate agent to be shut. And the unction led me to this place. And then I looked in the window, and we're looking at all the houses, and we're going, well, they, this isn't the right house. They're too expensive, or, or they didn't have enough bedrooms, or there's no office. And we said, this, but we were about to leave. And as we were walking out the door, I said, no, I've had an unction from the Lord. God has impressed upon me. Our house is here. And I went back in, and I sat down. I said to the estate agent, I said, you know, we're Christians. I said, and I believe that our house is here. Have you got anything else? Any other house anywhere? And she went, oh, um, oh, do you know, I think I've got one house. It was at the back of the filing cabinet, right at the back on the bottom drawer. She picked it up and she opened it. And we looked at the details. And we went, that's the house. And as soon as we found it, we went to view it. We opened the front door. We said, this is it. And we bought that house. It was an unction of the Lord. The Holy Spirit can direct our paths. He can lead us. And when we listen to him, um, great and mighty things can happen. Hallelujah. Now, I'll read it from Acts chapter 2. You've heard it many times. And it starts with, When the day of Pentecost came, and of the 364 days of the year. So when the day of Pentecost came, there were 365 days in the year. Why did Jesus choose the day of Pentecost to pour out his Holy Spirit on the church. Why did Jesus do this exactly the 15th day after Easter? What is so important about the day of Pentecost? It was already a feast. That's the first point. The Old Testament feast of Pentecost was known as Shavuot, or the Feast of Weeks, known as Pentecost. And the word pente means 50. And so Pentecost happens 50 days after the resurrection of Christ. And, uh, but for us, the 50th day from the day of the last time the Lamb of God was crucified. And that is the feast, and we celebrate the resurrection of Jesus. But why did Jesus choose this feast to send Holy Spirit? What makes Pentecost so fitting a time for Jesus to give his Holy Spirit to the church? Well, it was, as our slide says, it was known as the Feast of Weeks, and it was the first major festival of the Israel, well, what was the first major festival, the most important festival for the Israelites? Passover. Passover is the most important festival uh, for the Israelites. And Pentecost uh, was the first day after Passover. And it's the second most important uh, festival. And the Feast of Weeks began. Pentecost is an agricultural festival. It was a great celebration and uh, it went on for seven weeks. Seven times seven is 49 days, being God's number. It was a perfect harvest, a celebration of harvest. Now remember, Paul Benje illuminated us that Jesus was always seemingly on the way to a feast, at a feast, or leaving a feast. And on the first day of the Feast of Pentecost, the first sheaf of the barley harvest was presented to Yahweh as an offering to God. The first feast of the barley crop and on the last day, seven weeks later, of the Feast of Pentecost, the first sheaf of the wheat harvest was offered to God as the first fruits of the wheat harvest. So Pentecost actually marks the beginning of the grain harvest and the end 
of the grain harvest. And so Jesus chose this day because it's all about harvest. Hallelujah. And the second reason Jesus chose this day is because of the Great Commission. The church had received Jesus' commission just before he returned to heaven. Matthew 28 says this, Jesus came to them and said, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them into the name of the Father and of the Son of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I'm with you always to the very end of the age. And so at the birth of the church, this commission, this delegated authority that Jesus has given to the church, it comes upon the church in the form of the baptism, the empowering, the fire of the Holy Spirit. So the church is born in power to fulfill the commission. The church is born in fat power and in fire to fulfill the commission of God to go into all nations. The wonderful thing about the kingdom of God is there'll be every tribe, every nation, every color, every creed in it. Hallelujah. And it will be united for eternity. And so this power is in the church today. It is for every single member of the church, every single Christian. There are no second class Christians. Hallelujah. There are no second class Christians. God has given us all the ability to have gifts and have seasons of gifts. And God has given us the ability to receive a greater power, a power to enable us to exercise our gifts. There are no second class um, citizens of the kingdom of God. However, we do need to allow, Helena said in one of her opening prayers, invade us. Let me give you every area of my life. Let me receive all those things from you. And we need to receive the pilot or the bursting flames of the Holy Spirit in our lives. And there is a power in the church available for every member. As I said, there are no second-class citizens. In fact, the prophet Joel saw this vision. He declared that the Holy Spirit and his workings was for every single Christian in the last days. Are we in the last days? Yes, we are. And Joel saw that men and women will receive the Holy Spirit. Joel saw that young and old will receive Holy Spirit. All God's servants would receive Holy Spirit for the empowerment to do the work of God. And furthermore, the true church of Jesus Christ would continue to receive Holy Spirit right up until the end with the signs of God in the heavens and the signs of God on the earth. Holy Spirit would be there in the church until the glorious day of the Lord's return. Hallelujah. Holy Spirit is here now. He is here now in power. He wants to minister to his people. And Holy Spirit can do all the things that Jesus was doing through us. Hallelujah. And all God's servants would receive Holy Spirit. Hallelujah. And there's a third reason why Jesus chose uh, this particular day. Pentecost. The day of Pentecost, or, or rather the, the end of the final harvest of Pentecost to bring power to the church. Our reading ended with these words. And everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Amen. Shall we say that together? And everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. You see, the whole point of Pentecost, the whole point of the birth of the church, the whole point of this day that Jesus chose was the harvest time of souls has come. Amen. The harvest time of souls has come and is now here, here with us in our local community. The time is now. Amen. Harvest time is now. And verse 21 says, everyone, everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. How can they call upon the name of the Lord unless they hear? How can they call unless they have an understanding? How can they call unless somebody tells them? Our commission is to go out in the power of the Holy Spirit, to listen, to feel the unction of God. God will have his perfect timing for you to go and speak to someone. God will have his perfect timing. He sets things up for you and for me to do. Jesus sent the Holy Spirit to the church 
and has birthed us in power on the day of Pentecost precisely because this is the season of harvest. It's not a harvest of barley. It's not a harvest of wheat. Let's say it together. It's a harvest of souls. It is a harvest of people. The time has come for the church to rise. The harvest is ready. And it says, everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. What an amazing promise that is. Everyone who calls on the name of Jesus Christ will be saved. I need you, Jesus. I thank you, Jesus, for what you've done on the cross. Come into my life, Jesus. I need a savior. Come and save me. Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Hallelujah. And of course, when we think about harvest, then the harvest of wheat and the harvest of barley, well, they go into the storehouses of the farmer's barns, don't they? But the harvest, the harvest of souls, is gathered into the barn of God's kingdom for eternity. It's a different barn. It's a barn, it's the farmer. The great farmer is God himself. The great shepherd is Jesus himself. And he's calling the harvest into the kingdom of God, into the barn house of uh, the kingdom of God. And rather than taking a sickle or uh, a scythe to cut down the harvest, to gather it in, they didn't have combined harvesters in those days. It was all manual labor. The Holy Spirit is working in us. The Spirit is working in the church of Jesus. We, you and me, are like the sickle. You and me are a bit like the combine harvester to show the power of God to call in the harvest. And each of us receives different gifts and abilities to do this. But as Paul Benger said, I love Paul so much because he's so profound. He said, be an invite. You and I can just be an invite. You don't have to know doctrine or theology. You do have to love a person, have compassion and pray for them. But you and I can be an invite. And we've got some activities that are coming up. Flamen flamingo with... I always get confused. Is it flamingo or is it flamenco? Flamenco with Francesca. Flamenco with Francesca. There's an event that's coming. And you can be an invite to a person. Do let them know it's in a church. There will be some testimonies, short testimonies, 10 minutes each, of people just saying a bit about how they've met Jesus and what Jesus has done for them. And the rest of the evening will be <laughs> flamenco. Okay? Amen. I should have practiced that. I can do better than that. Anyway, so rather than there being a sickle or a scythe, you and I are to call in and to bring in that harvest in Jesus' name. Be an invite. This church is starting to do more and more things. We've come out of not being able to, and now we're doing things which has got a gospel edge to it. Everything you will find that we're doing will have some form of gospel edge, unless it's learning about how to be safe online. Do you know, I mean, that's a gospel in its own sense. And uh, David did a great presentation keeping safe online. And I've said to David, he's got to do this again. We have to invite everybody into this place to get them to be safe online so they don't get ripped off. And we don't have to mention Jesus or anything. We just need to get them into the, into the room. And then once they get to see this place, they'll go, wow, is this a church? And when they have a good time here, you never know the unction of God might bring them back and then they hear the gospel. Hallelujah. So you and I be an invite. We can call people in. And uh, Jesus said to us, didn't he, in John 4.30, he said this, open your eyes and look at the fields. They are ripe for harvest. The fields are white unto harvest, and oh, the laborers are so few. You don't want to be a few laborer at Salt Church. We want every person to be a laborer in Salt Church. Amen? Amen. Go out, be an invite. And I want to tell you an important contrast as we start to draw to a close about Pentecost under the Old Covenant and Pentecost under the New Covenant because there's something significant. Now, if you know your Old Testament, as I know you do because you read your Bibles, as you know your Old Testament, you will know that when Moses gave the law to the people, the people rebelled because Moses had been up a mountain for a long time. What's happened to Moses? He's been up there a bit long. Where is he? Perhaps he's fallen down a crevice. 
Where is he? God called him up. He's supposed to be coming back with something, a present to us as a people. They got impatience. Nothing was happening. So they made it happen themselves. And what did they do? They bullied Aaron to make a golden calf. And then they bowed down and worshipped it. So when Moses comes down the mountain with the law of God, the beautiful, wonderful law of God, written in lapis lazuli, and he comes, the Ten Commandments, he sees what the people have done, and he smashes them with his disgust at the people. And what happened on that day? That day, the first Pentecost, what happened on that day? It was actually the first Pentecost. If you read your Bibles, the receiving of the law was, was received on the first day of Pentecost. Amen. You might not know that, but now you do know it. And so the giving of the law was 50 days after the first Passover. And it was after their last night in slavery, the next day they left towards the promised land. And that's when Pentecost begins. And they arrive on the last day of Pentecost, the day that Jesus sends Holy Spirit in the festival. And the Israelites, well, what happened? The Israelites were at Sinai, and on that first day of Pentecost in the Old Testament, the scriptures tell us that 3,000 died. And it was God's punishment, the immediate punishment of God for breaking the law of God, 3,000 died. And then later on in Acts chapter 2, following the great sermon from Peter on that Holy Spirit day of Pentecost, he received the unction of the word, and he spoke with power, and the power of God came out of this man. And it touched the hearts of the people. And about 3,000 were saved and baptized on that first day of Pentecost of the church. God has a wonderful way of balancing out the bad stuff that happened with the good stuff that had happened. So on the first day of Pentecost, for us, the birth of the church, 3,000 came into eternal life. Hallelujah. And of course, all of these reasons... The, what the feast means, what the, the harvest means, and, and what happened with the giving of the Old Testament and the new covenant of Jesus in his blood. Of course, Jesus was going to send Holy Spirit at Pentecost. It is the perfect day. And for us as the church, Pentecost is every single day. We don't get up in the morning and, and Holy Spirit is gone unless we don't want him to be with us. We can wake up every morning and have Holy Spirit in us and upon us. And we can wake up and say, Lord, what have you got planned for me today? We can be an obedient people walking with God in the power of the Holy Spirit. And the grace of God in Christ Jesus and the Holy Spirit of God are here, here in us, calling people into the forgiveness of God in Christ Jesus to receive the life of God to eternity. And you and I, the church, we are empowered by the Spirit to do the works of God that he's called us into. Amen. Now, looking at you at the moment, you might not feel that you're empowered. You might think, what, me? I can't do the things that Peter did. I can't do that, that big sermon. I can't do the things that people might do up here on the stage. But I tell you something, you are in the armies of God. You are a soldier in the army of God. And if you listen to the Holy Spirit, you can do the things of God. In fact, you can do more than perhaps we can do. Have you ever thought about that? Just imagine if every person invited someone to flamenco with Francesca, we would have 400, 300, 400 people in the church. That would be amazing, wouldn't it? So you can do it and I can do it, even if we don't feel like it. So to conclude, in the physical realm, Pentecost celebrates the end to slavery in Egypt for the Israelites. They went out from slavery towards the promised land. But in the spiritual, Pentecost celebrates the end of slavery to sin to all who would believe. The end of slavery to sin for all who would believe. The harvest is white and ripe and people are coming in and they're being saved from every tribe, nation, language and tongue. Do I hear an amen? Amen. amen. And secondly, in the physical Pentecost, it's all about a grain harvest. It's a harvest festival, barley and wheat. But in the spiritual Pentecost, it's about a harvest of human souls for the kingdom of God. Amen? Amen. 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 And in the physical, Pentecost is 50 days after Passover. It's on the night of Passover. 
Jesus broke bread. This is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. It was a Passover. So in the physical 50, or Pentecost is 50 days after Passover. In the spiritual, Passover is the new covenant in the body and blood of Jesus Christ, making forgiveness available to those who would believe. And Pentecost is when the power came to make that happen. And it came to the church, to you and to me. In the physical, Pentecost <coughs> is a seven-week harvest festival celebration. In the spiritual, Pentecost is about life in all its abundance, starting now, here on earth, welling up to eternal life for eternity. Halle Do I get a hallelujah? hallelujah? I'll see your hallelujah and I'll raise you two amens. So Pentecost, Pentecost, it is the sign and the seal and the power of God in the spirit of God when we are born again to eternal life. When you say yes to the Lord Jesus Christ, Holy Spirit comes. But he comes initially at salvation. He changes everything and there's a deposit. But there's more for every single Christian. There is more of Holy Spirit that we can have the birth of the church and the new birth to all who would believe happened at Pentecost when the Father and the Son sent the Holy Spirit to lead us into the commission of God to go into the world and to preach the gospel, making disciples and baptizing people into the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. I tell you what, it was a great day of Pentecost on that day. And the church can celebrate Pentecost every single day. God does his work of the Spirit in us and in Soul Church every single day that we are here. Hallelujah. God bless you. Amen. <laughs>